All right. Well, we are live and in living color. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another fabulous and fantastic Onward Productions virtual fireside. Happy Sunday. I hope your Sabbath has been truly remarkable. And if it hasn't been yet, it's about to get epic because we have the most incredible lineup of speakers here tonight. We're gonna bring them on in just a second, but if you're just joining us on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you may be joining us from, go over to the comments, hop in there and let us know where you are joining us from. We already have Diana who's here from Utah. Uh, we've got Mickey who's here from Aurora. Thank you so much. This is gonna be a truly amazing evening. And so without further ado, let's bring in our incredible panel of game-changing guests and speakers tonight. We have Olympic champion Peter Vidmar, we've got President Brad Wilcox, and we've got Nicola McCulloch. These are three of the most incredible humans on the planet, and they're all here at the same time. Hi, guys. Oh. <laughs> oh, it is so good to see you all. And I am so, fa I love doing firesides with lots of people that are better looking than I am, which is not hard to do, <laughs> but it's really nice. They get to look at you and not me. We've got Mesa, Arizona. We've got Minnesota. We have people joining us from all over the country. Nicola, how are you feeling tonight? I know you are so excited for tonight. These are two of your absolute heroes, aren't they? Heroes is an understatement. I could not be more excited. And as I was saying before, I'm trying to channel my nervousness into excitement. So we all have a positive experience. <laughs> oh, it's great. You are a powerhouse. We cannot wait to hear from you. And this, Brother Vidmar, this is the first time you've joined us here on Onward Productions. Thank you for taking time to be with us tonight. I'm thrilled. I've got great company I'm keeping right now. So how could I not want to do this? <laughs> this is, well, and what a timely, what a timely time to have you on with the Olympics right around the corner. I mean, come on. This is uh, this is absolutely incredible. What a great topic, turning turning goals into gold. And then, of course, we have a man who I think everybody loves with, with unlimited capacity, President Brad Wilcox. President Wilcox, how are you? I'm doing great and just so happy to be with everybody tonight. Thanks for tuning in because, you know, uh, it's a little hard after a long Sunday full of meetings to have one more but we appreciate you taking this time so that we can just share some testimonies with you and share some of our experiences with you. We're gonna have an uplifting night. Oh, it's gonna be great. We've got people joining us from California. We've got Alabama. We've got North Carolina. We've got St. George. We have Nicola's favorite aunt from Holiday. Uh, and we've got we've got Elmo, Utah. We've got people joining from all over. If you are just joining us, get ready for an incredible evening. Please go into the chat. Let us know where you're watching from and also prepare your questions. We're going to have just a little bit of time once we get done hearing these incredible messages tonight to be able to answer your questions. And I know you'll have a lot of them. And so without further ado, we are going to kick things off. I'm going to open with an opening prayer and then we will get to hear from Brother Vidmar. Then we'll get to hear from Nicola. Then we'll get to hear from President Wilcox. It's going to be a wonderful evening. I'm going to go ahead and start us off with an opening prayer, if that's okay with all of you. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be gathered here tonight. We are so thankful that we have this opportunity through this platform, through Onward Productions, and through this technology to be able to connect with brothers and sisters from all over the country and maybe even all over the world. Father, we are so thankful for the gospel. We are so thankful for the opportunity to be able to speak of things that matter, that are good, and that bring joy. We pray that thy spirit will attend this evening. We pray that thou will bless all those who are watching from wherever they may be watching, that they can find the answer that they may be seeking, that they can feel the influence of the spirit and gain a greater testimony of the truthfulness of this gospel. We pray for our brilliant and amazing speakers. We pray that thou wilt bless them, that they will be able to do thy will this evening. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. All right. Brad and Nicola, we are going to send you backstage and I'm going to hang out with uh, with Brother Vidmar just for a second. And uh, now, now I, I told you this before, Brother Vidmar, but 
Um, I think my sister, Kristen, is watching. And I told you that she rarely watches these firesides, but when she found out you were going to be on, there was nothing stopping her. You are a hero to so many. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, you're so kind. I look at, and uh, hello, Krista. <laughs> <laughs> now I now I gotta. You guys know if you come to this these virtual firesides that I host, you know that I rarely read a bio, a and it's just because uh, you know I I just feel like I. <laughs> If, I've, if I'm able to have a personal connection with someone, I love to just tell a personal story. But Brother Vidmar is so incredibly accomplished. I mean, game changer in every single way that there's no, I can't do anything but read your bio, Brother Vidmar. So you might blush a little bit as I read this, but I want everybody to know the accomplished life that you've led. Is that okay if I tell everybody and read this for them? So long as you're brief, and and and, and I hope that you outlive me because I guess you can give my eulogy at my funeral. But, <laughs> no, really, I, I don't need much of an introduction. Yeah. I don't need it. <laughs> well, Brother Vidmar is a Latter Day Saint gymnast and an Olympic gold medalist. I mean, how many of us get a chance to meet an Olympic gold medalist? He was inducted into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame. In all, he won two Olympic golds and one silver medal. Brother Vidmar was a member of the 1984 men's Olympic team that won the U.S.'s first and only team gold at the Los Angeles Games. He's an alumnus of UCLA with a degree in economics and host of the annual Peter Vidmar Men's Gymnastic Invitational at Brentwood School in Los Angeles. Uh, Brother Vidmar has been a gymnastics anchor for both CBS and ESPN. He's been a motivational speaker for over 30 years. In fact, an, interest, an industry publication named him as one of the top 10 motivational speakers in the U.S. You're with a top 10. Not only do we get to hear from a number one gold medal winning champion, but also a top 10 speaker in the U.S. That's pretty special. He is uh, also the co-chairman of the U.S. Olympic Committee Summer Sports Summit. And in 1998, Brother Vidmar was inducted into the International Gymnastics Hall of Fame. He is the highest scoring American gymnast in Olympic history. There are so many other accomplishments and accolades, but this is one that I also think is so critically important. Maybe the most important, I don't know, Brother Vidmar, I bet you'd agree with me here. Uh, he's married to a former gymnast, Donna Harris. They have five children and leave, live in Heber City. Uh, he presided over the Australia Melbourne mission for the church from July, 2016 to July, 2019. And he served in the church as a public affairs specialist, a seminary teacher, a bishop, and a counselor in a stake presidency. And in October of 2020, Brother Vidmar began serving as a member of the Young Men General Board. And so with a pedigree like that, it's, easy, it's, it's so nice to be reminded of how terribly little I've accomplished in my life. <laughs> Brother Vidmar, thank you for being here. I'm going to turn the time over to you. Well, thank you, Kevin. All that matters is that we do the things that really matter in life, and and, uh, and I'm grateful for a savior that allows me to make mistakes and 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 make them right. But uh, I'm excited to be here, and I think the audience actually might go a little bit farther, Kevin, than you uh, realize. I I just got a text uh, a little while ago from some of my missionaries that served with me in Australia, and they're living in Tahiti, or they're from Tahiti, and I'm hoping that they're on. So. I'm going to quickly say hello to Elder Liao and Sister Holman and Elder Paratau and Elder Manate and Sister Amaru and any of my other wonderful Tahitian missionaries that might be watching today. We, we miss you. We love you. Um, actually, um, Sister Holman and Elder Paratau just recently were married and they have a little baby. So uh, that, that uh, it's been nice to see these marriages take place in the mission and after the mission, actually. So. So hello to all, all of you out there. It's a privilege to be here on the, on the program. With the, with the title or with the theme of turning goals into gold, I thought I'd share just a few things, but I'm gonna begin with what I begin when I, uh, with my missionaries when they show up. Um, when, uh, when our new missionaries come in, when they fly into the Melbourne airport, we pick them up, we, we take them right to downtown Melbourne and we throw them out in the street and ask them to start meeting people. It's, quite a baptism by fire, and it can be a little nerve wracking at times. And uh, some of them wonder, wow, what have I got myself into? And uh, and then the very next day we do our training for our golden missionaries. But that's what we call our new missionaries. We call them goldens. I like gold. And, um, and so uh, I always share with them a scripture that hopefully that they can relate to. And before you set or reach goals, you, you have to believe that you can. 
And you have to have faith that you can and the courage to see those things happen. And so I always share with them the first chapter of Joshua. Now, as you may know, Joshua was the prophet that succeeded the great Moses. And you can imagine how maybe he felt a little insecure knowing that he had to succeed that great prophet Moses. Now at this time, as you know, the children of Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They were not allowed to set foot into the promised land yet. And after the death of Moses and after, um, after 40 years, they were permitted and commanded to cross the river Jordan into uh, the promised land. And uh, the Lord speaks to Joshua to encourage him in his new calling. Now he begins in, in Joshua, he says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise up, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. And he says, uh, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses, he's telling Joshua, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And then he says this, he says to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Then he says it again in verse seven, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. He later gives him some instruction, turn not from, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. In other words, stay focused on what you're supposed to be doing. And then he says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. In other words, study your scriptures. So don't get distracted, study your scriptures. And then you jump ahead to verse nine, he says it again, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a, cur good, and, and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And I always ask myself, why did he tell Joshua three times? to be strong and courageous. And, and I thought, well, maybe when Joshua began this journey, as we all do begin many journeys in life, maybe he wasn't feeling strong or courageous. Maybe he was feeling a little weak and a little fearful. And so the Lord needed to kind of strengthen him and to remind him what he can do and what he needed to do to stay focused on the task at hand. And it's kind of exciting to, to go on to verse 10 um, you could see Joshua maybe felt that blessing from the Lord, that, that encouragement. And it says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the host, command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days, you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And now all of a sudden, Joshua had this righteous confidence. If you jump ahead to verse 16, it says that they answered Joshua saying, all that thou commandest us, we will do. And with us, so without sin with us, we will go. And I just love that Joshua finally grasped the vision of what it was that he was asked to do and what he now knew that he could do. And so I, as I, I think back on my youth when I, when I began gymnastics, I mean, we, we've got the Olympics coming up. Um, they begin on July 23rd, my wedding anniversary. Um, I guess they planned that for a reason. And, um, and I remember when I began gymnastics, it just looked like something fun to do. But I began my journey in gymnastics with an Olympian as a coach. His name was Makoto Sakamoto. He was the USA's best gymnast in the 60s and early 70s. And after finishing his career at the Munich Olympics in 1972, he decided he wanted to start coaching. He put a little ad in a local paper in Culver City, California. I have the ad, my mother saved everything, and it says, Future Olympic Champions Sought in Gymnastics. That was the title of the article. And it advertised trials for a local club in the Department of Parks and Recreation with this gymnast Olympian Makoto Sakamoto. My dad knew who he was. My dad did gymnastics when he was young. And he says, Pete, do you want to try this? And I said, yeah, I want to try it. And so I went out and tried out. And I was one of five boys that he picked for this experimental program. And he made... Uh, my goals come alive. He, he, he filled my head with stories of the Olympics and of the world championships. And, uh, and it made me want to have those experiences myself. I remember him always saying, never saying, if you ever make the U.S. team or if you could ever be an Olympian or compete in the world championships, he always uses the word, he used the word when as if it was almost an expectation. And so 
I believed him. And so I thought, well, if I just do what he says, maybe these things will happen to me. And so, uh, so began that journey when I was 11 years old. And I started going just one day a week just to have fun doing gymnastics. And pretty soon I was going two days a week and three days a week. And finally I was training six days a week with my coach. And, um, and I, um, I remember uh, the days that it was really challenging and difficult. And I also realized at the end of those days, that's when I learned the most about myself, about what my limits were, what I really could do. And, and so, you know, he tried to, um, he, he, he made hard work fun, but he also helped me to catch the vision of where possibly I could go. One, one, one moment that really stood out to me, and I, I'd like you to kind of understand this, and, and maybe this will help you, is that uh, I, I had I, I'd had a successful high school career. Um, uh, I made the U.S. men's national team when I was a junior in high school, which in men's gymnastics is, is a little rare. And, um, and so I knew I was on a good path. I had chosen to, con to continue my training with my coach, who was now the assistant coach at UCLA in Los Angeles, where I grew up. And so I remember traveling to the U.S. Olympic Festival in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And it was, um, it was a, kind of an Olympic Games for American athletes. It, it was all the athletes in the country, the best athletes in the country, track and field, gymnastics, swimming, diving, judo, wrestling, all the sports. And they divided all of, all of us athletes up into four different teams by region, the West team, the North team, the East team. And uh, we had different uniforms that signified which team we were on. We, we had an opening ceremonies marching into the stadium of the U.S. Air Force Academy, which became the Olympic Village. We stayed in the dorms there at the Air Force Academy. And we kind of felt like we were at maybe a little mini Olympic Games. And it was a great experience. And my coach was chosen to be the coach of the West team. And so he was there. And so um, since we were both there at the same time, I would meet him every morning to go for a little run and to do a series of exercises and then mentally review my routines that I would be performing later on that week. And we finished our run in, in this beautiful quad at the Air Force Academy on the campus, right by this chapel at the base of the Rocky Mountains. It's this beautiful setting. And I finished my run with him and did my exercises. And before going back to the dorms to shower up and get ready for the rest of the day, my coach looked at me and he says, hey, Pete, you know, I think this morning training is really good for you. I said, yeah. No, I think it's really good for you. Yeah. He says, Peter, do you know what a vow is? I said, a what? A vow. Yeah, it's like a really big promise. Yeah, it's a big promise. What do you say that we make a vow today that you're going to do morning training like this every day till you graduate from college? No, I hadn't started college yet. But this is a man that I respected. I wanted to make him happy. So I looked at him. And on the outside, I heard myself saying, okay. But on the inside, what was I saying? I was saying, oh, man. Oh, come on, Mako. Really? Every day till I graduate? This isn't one big promise. This is like 1,500 little promises. Every day till I graduate. I haven't even started school yet. And what if I don't graduate? <laughs> and then he smiled, looked at me, says, good, Peter. And he put his hand forward and said, let's shake on it. So now I shook the hand of a man that I really respected. And now I was bound by that handshake to keep my word. And I got to be honest with you. It was really easy. The first couple weeks, it was really easy. After the competition, I went back to California. I moved into the dorms at UCLA and, and uh, had a great uh, teammate, roommate, uh, one of the other best students in the country. And he was, and we were motivated and we'd get up every morning and we'd go for a run and we'd do our exercises and the weather's great, it's Southern California, and then it rained. And I thought, do I have to do this in the rain? Oh, I shook his hand. And then I had the flu. I thought, I can't even get out of bed. Do I have to do this when I have the flu? And I shook his hand. So I'd get up and I'd run and I'd go back to bed after the run. Um, when I sprained my ankle, I thought, I can't even walk. Do I, have to? Oh, I, I limped through it. Why? Because I shook his hand. And so for the next four years, every day but Sunday, I did my morning training. My coach did it too, but uh, not with me because he lived farther away and he had to commute to, to, to workouts. But we did our morning trainings and we first we'd compare notes, but then soon we stopped even talking about it because he knew I was doing it. I knew he was doing it. And so I just made it a part of my daily routine. That little extra effort 
uh, that helped me to stay focused and begin each day knowing that I had some big goals ahead of me and that this morning training would help and make a little difference for me. I actually did it for five years because I did graduate in four years. That, that was a nice incentive, but I decided to keep doing it until my last competition at the Olympic Games. But I never missed a day uh, because I shook his hand. And so I, I, I give you this story and this example to help you to, to ask yourself, is there something that I can really commit to? Maybe, maybe even a friend or a family member that I can say, hey, hold me accountable to do this. Shake their hand. Don't do it unless you know you're going to keep that promise um, and, and do your very, very best to keep it. Now, sometimes we don't keep our promises. Sometimes in the gospel, we, we make mistakes, and some of the mistakes are, are not fun. They're not pleasant. Sometimes we sin. We break God's commandments. When we promised at baptism that we would keep the commandments, when we would, we would make those covenants when we take the sacrament, and yet we all make mistakes. And, you know, we have a Savior that loves us, that loved us so much that he died for us, and that he atoned for our sins. And that when we simply acknowledge what we've done and turn from that and turn back towards the Savior, he forgives us. I love Doctrine and Covenants, section 58, verses 42 and 43. Um, Behold, he who has repented of his sin, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. That means that that the Savior forgets, that the Lord forgets. I will remember your sins no more. Now, I remember my sins. I remember the things I did wrong. I remember the silly things and the dumb things that I've done. Why don't I forget? Well, I think the only reason is that I just don't do it again. I just don't want to go there again. And and and, and, I, and I just love that the, that the Lord takes us as we are when we repent and that we are forgiven and that we are completely clean. So... At the end of this life, he doesn't say to me, hey, Peter, you know, um, when, you, when you made that big mistake when you were 15, I'm, I'm so glad you repented. Oh, and when you were 23, that was bad. But hey, you repented. Good job. And, and what about when you were 50 and, and you really hurt that person's feelings? Wow, why did you do that? That was dumb. But hey, you repented and you're forgiven. Good job. That's not how the, the conversation goes. It's simply well done. Now, good and faithful servant. And I'm so grateful because I know that the Lord doesn't lie. When he says he doesn't remember our sins, he means it. He will not remember our sins. Sometimes we, we, we don't have the courage sometimes to maybe talk to someone we need to, maybe even our bishop. But I know that your bishop will honor you and, and praise you for the courage it took to talk with him. And he'll be so overjoyed that you sat down to speak with him about something that maybe you feel like you need to repent of. Um, and so I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my Savior. I'm grateful for the gift of repentance. I'm grateful that the Lord wants to give us strength and courage to do the right things in our lives. And, um, and, and, and with that, then, we start to get a vision of what it is that we'd like to do or what we'd like to become. So for all of you that are watching and listening today, tonight, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to think about where you'd like to be five years from now, five, ten years from now. Where do you see yourself? Where would you like to see yourself? Who would you like to become? What would you like to be doing? What would you like to have done? And, and, and how can you um, catch the vision of what you really can do and what you can be? Let me finish with a little, a little story. My, my, my teammate, Tim Daggett, he's the guy that covers gymnastics on NBC Sports. You're going to hear his voice and you're going to see him as he covers the Olympics in Tokyo. He's my closest friend on the team. My oldest son, Timothy, is named after him. And his oldest son is named Peter, so that's kind of obnoxious, but we're good friends. He's a great guy. Tim and I used to walk in the gym every day, fired up. We're ready to work. We're going to work hard. Why? Because the Olympics are coming up. And our first event of the day was almost always the floor exercise, that 40-foot by 40-foot mat that we tumble and flip around on. And, and the key to perfecting our routines for competition is simply repetition. We do them over and over again. We finish all of our routines. We're going to huff and a puff. And I look at Tim and say, come on, man. Got to keep going. Okay, stay focused. Olympics are coming up. Yeah, Olympics are coming up. We go to the pommel horse. That's our best event. Tim and I both medaled on pommel horse at the Olympics. We do our pommel horse routines over and over again. Finish all those routines. Say, come on, man. Got to keep going. Olympics are coming up. Yeah, Olympics are coming up. We go to the rings, do our ring routines over and over again. Then we go to the vault and then to the parallel bars, then to the horizontal bar, the last event of the day. 
And, and, and by that time, we've been in the gym for six or seven hours, and we are not nearly as excited as we were at the beginning of the day. We are exhausted and we are beat. And at this time, you know, and that last routine on the horizontal bar that we're doing, it's just as important as the first one we did on the floor exercise. They're both worth 10 points, no more, no less. I got to get excited about what I do and be good at it, especially now when I don't want to. So at this point, we kind of have to put some pressure on. I'd look at Tim and I'd say this. We did this a lot. I'd say, hey, Tim, I'd say, why are we here? What are we doing this for? What's the goal? And we identify and say, okay, I don't care how you feel. Is that still worth working for right now? Is it still worth it? And if we had a clear picture of that goal, the answer for us is always, yeah, yeah, it's still worth it. Make us focus about that much more. And so Tim and I, what we try to imagine at that moment, at the end of the day, in that, in that quiet, empty gym, is we try to imagine that we could have happened to us the ultimate gymnastics experience, the greatest experience possible in the sport, and this is it. I'd say, Tim, let's put some pressure on. Let's just imagine right now, I don't care how you feel, let's just imagine it's the Olympic Games. It's the men's gymnastics team finals. The U.S. team's on their last event of the night. It just happens to be the horizontal bar because that's what we're working at the time. Let's just imagine that the last two guys out just happen to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. We haven't even made the team yet, so what? And here's the catch. This is where we thought it was funny. We start to laugh. I'd say, Tim, let's just imagine that we are neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we have to perform our routines perfectly right now to win the Olympic team gold medal. And we'd say, yeah, right. We're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They, they were first in the world, the world championships. We were fourth just six months earlier. We didn't even win a medal. It's not going to happen. But what if? Would we be nervous? Would we be excited? Yeah. So in this empty gym, I chalk up my hands, close my eyes, and vividly imagine that I was in the Olympic arena, that there were 15,000 people there and 2 billion watching me live on television. And I have one chance to make this performance successfully or we're going to lose. And my heart, my heart starts to pound. Tim's over in the corner of the gym, and, and he, would, he would say something like this. Next up from the United States, Peter Vidmar. Just like the loudspeaker at the Olympic Games, I'd imagine my name is called and get ready to go. Now, you don't perform when you feel like it in my sport. You go only when the judge allows you to perform. That's when he pushes a button that makes a green light go on, and he raises his hand. And the longer you wait for the green light to go on, the more nervous you're going to get. Tim's over in the corner of the gym in charge of this imaginary green light. And after a long time of waiting and saying and doing nothing, when he thought maybe I least expected it, finally he'd shout out, green light. And so I'd imagine the green light was on. Was on. I'd look at my coach, imagine my coach is the Olympic superior judge. I'd raise my hand, he'd raise his hand right back. I'd turn, face that bar, grab that bar, and begin my routine. Now, this is just a workout, but if I fell off the bar there, if I made a mistake there, oh, ruined my day. I was miserable. Why? Because I placed importance in what I was doing. I didn't say, which I easily could have said at the end of a long, tiring day, and say, so what, Peter, you fell off the high bar. Who cares? No one's watching. Big deal. Just a workout. It's just another day. Just go home. Just, just, just work hard tomorrow. Doesn't matter. No, it mattered. Felt like I lost the whole competition. But if I made my routine successfully, I felt fantastic. I'd lie on my dismount and get all fired up. Yes, I'd drive home every day after a performance like that and say, wow, I just won the Olympics today. That was awesome. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Got me excited. We did that for practice because we knew realistically it's not going to happen, but it's good practice because it taught us to focus and to be diligent at something when, when we didn't feel like it. Most important time to put forth effort. That's when we learn the most about ourselves. Well, a funny thing happened on July 31st, 1984, and I'll finish with this. It was the Olympic Games. It was the men's gymnastics team finals. And the U.S. men's team was on their last event of the night. And it just happened to be the horizontal bar. And the last two guys up for the USA just happened to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. And here's the catch. And all of a sudden, we weren't laughing because it wasn't funny anymore. We were neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions. And we had to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. Well, there's six gymnasts on each team, but only five scores count. It's different now, but back in my day, that's how it was. So if one guy made a mistake, that's okay. You throw out the low score and you count the five best scores. Our first guy up for the team on the high bar was Scott Johnson from the University of Nebraska. 
just an incredible athlete. He had a phenomenal competition, was kind of our leadoff man on most of the events, got us off to a great start. But on his last performance of the games, he lets go of the high bar for his triple backflip dismount. On the third flip, he opened up a little too soon. It caused him to stumble forward and touch his hands and knees on the ground. And he stood up and made a mistake. And we thought, oh, no, chances are next five routines are going to have to count. The pressure's on. No more mistakes. Jim Hartman, Scott's teammate from the University of Nebraska, goes up next. Does a great routine. Lance's dismount scores a 9.9. He jumps off the podium or platform, and, 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 and he runs around the platform. For some reason, Jim runs straight over to me, and he's huffing and puffing. I'm getting ready for my routine, and he's taking off his leather hand guards that we wear on the high bar. He says, hey, Pete, don't worry about it, man. It's not that bad out there. Just relax. Just enjoy yourself. Just have a good time. Yeah. He, he was happy because... He was done. Olympics were over for Jim. It's a nice feeling. Bart Carner goes up next, scores a 9.95. Uh, uh, Mitch Gaylord goes up after him, scores a 9.95. And then Tim Daggett goes up after um, Mitch, and he scores, does a perfect routine, perfect dismount, and scores a perfect 10. Then it was my turn. Now, I told you that five out of six scores count. Well, how many guys just perform now for our team? Five. Well, let's just take a peek at the first five scores and add them up, including Scott's routine with a little mistake. Add them all up just to see where we stand. Guess what? We just won the Olympic team gold medal. Forget me. We just won the gold medal. See, Scott's mistake wasn't really that bad, and the other four scores are so high, they kind of helped to offset Scott's mistake. That meant that even if the last two performers left from China, from China, if they scored perfect 10s on their last event, it's not going to be good enough. So with Tim's perfect 10, we had just secured the USA's first Olympic team gymnastics gold medal, male or female, since the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis. And that's when wooden club juggling, shot put, and long jump were three of the gymnastics events. It's definitely changed since then. But because it's locked up, this means that Peter Vidmar can fall off the high bar 57 times, and we're still gonna win the gold medal. And all of my teammates behind me, below the podium, all of them are done and celebrating. But none of them, none of the coaches, and no other human being told me that we had just won. So I walked up there, up there still thinking, this is it, Peter, if you don't make this, we're gonna lose. Now, the crowd's cheering wildly. Tim did a phenomenal job. They haven't given him a score yet. I can't go until he gets a score, and I get the green light. I'm pacing back and forth thinking, oh, I've got to make this routine. And I looked back and thought, what are my teammates so excited about? And all of a sudden, Tim scores a 10, and the crowd goes nuts. And I look at Tim's perfect 10, and I said, yay, Tim. And then the green light went on. Right before that, though, I looked at my coach, this man that began with me in gymnastics, Makoto Sakamoto. He was there as the USA assistant coach. looks up at me, and he gives me a smile. I looked down and gave him a smile right back. And he said one thing that went from here right down to here. He said, okay, Pete, let's go, all right? You know what to do. You've done this a thousand times, just like the end of every day back to the gym. Let's just do this one more time, and let's go home. You're ready. That's right. I'm prepared. I didn't wait till it was too late to figure out how to handle a situation like this. I did this every day at the end of every workout. So all of a sudden, as I was standing in this Olympic arena with the 15,000 people there and the 2 billion on television, in my mind, I just put myself back at that UCLA gym at the end of the day. And in my mind, when I raised my hand and signaled the Olympic superior judge, in my mind, I'm signaling my coach, just like I used to signal him every day at the end of every workout. And I turned, faced that bar, grabbed the bar, and, and did my routine. I finished it not quite as easily as I'd like to describe it to you, but it landed on my discount and scored a 9.95. And that's when we knew for sure, all of us knew, that we had won the gold medal. We, we, we got up on the victory stand for a very emotional medal ceremony. And we won for many, many reasons. But the most important of which is that, is that our journey didn't begin the day or the week or the month before the competition. Here's a shocker to all you students out there. We all know what it's called when you stay up all night studying for a test. We call it cramming, right? What, would you, did you know that you can't cram for the Olympic Games? Gee, one of the Olympics next week? Oh, better go to the gym, right? That doesn't happen. No, our preparation begins not days, weeks, or months, but literally years before that moment of truth. And the same is true with many important things in life. 
that your journey to a mission, your journey to a temple marriage, your journey to a happy family life begins now. Make decisions now of, of, of what you plan on doing in the future and start doing things now that help you to get there. And that, that includes a lot of different things. It includes daily routines of scripture and prayer uh, and, and, and seminary for those of you that are of seminary age. Seminary saved my life. Uh, I'm so grateful for that. And that was, I, I was a seminary teacher for four years. I know how important and valuable it is. Don't ever think that it's not going to make a difference in your life because it will. And I promise you that. I know that. Um, practice mind over mattress, right? Before you leave your mattress every morning, get down on your knees and pray. And, uh, and before you hit your mattress every night, get down on your knees and pray. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Have a conversation with him. Let him know how you really feel about things. Um, and, and practice mind over mattress when it comes to your scriptures. Have a time set aside each day that you study those scriptures, in particular, particularly the Book of Mormon. It is the Word of God and another testament of Jesus Christ. And as you do that, you will find the strength and you will find the courage that you need to accomplish great things in your life, things that the Lord has in store in many ways only for you. I know that he knows you. I know that he knows you by name. I know that he loves you. How do I know that? I know that because I know that he knows me. I've had experiences that, that, that are so strong that they're just as real as, as this computer that I'm looking at you through, uh, that Heavenly Father does know me by name, that he does love me. And I, I have felt the, the peace of, of what to me felt almost like his embrace. I love him. I love my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that he loves you. And I leave this with you in the sacred and holy name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. Um, Brother Vidmar, I am sitting here just glued to my screen, just captivated, be all off, all captivation. Um, you said something there at the end. You talked about the Savior's embrace. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking about your preparation for that gold medal in the 1984 Olympics, that it began years before, um, I thought about what is the thing I want in the future? I want that save. I want my savior's embrace. And I, I know, I think that we often consider that, that living the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know that it's a daily task, but there was something that shifted in my mind when I thought of the savior's embrace as a goal that I can work towards today. I, I don't know how to articulate it other than something clicked into place for me. And I'm thankful yeah. for you. Well, um, it's, not, it's not a one-time event. I don't, I don't mean to say it that way. I'm just saying that I, I, I know that when I try to align myself with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I feel the pleasure of my heavenly father and his son, that they're pleased. Um, and I also feel the pleasure when I correct wrongs that I've made, when I repent, I feel that same joy. Um, it just simply means we're, we're turning in the direction towards our Savior. Thank you so much for what you shared. You know, I, I know when someone like you has been in the public eye for a long time, um, I have so much respect for someone that can live the gospel, keep the standards, and do it in such a profound way as you've done for so many years. Thank you for that profound example. And thank you for your testimony and your stories and for being with us tonight. Brother Vidmar, that was truly magical. Thank you. It was my joy, thank you. Awesome, okay, wow. Boy, what an incredible start to this evening. Next up, we get to hear from an amazing woman, Nicola McCulloch. Now, let's go ahead and bring Nicola on, just real quick. Hi. Hey friend, how are you? I am so great. So happy. Good. To be here. That you was know, such an incredible message. So. Oh my gosh! Amazing, Nicola. You came on Onward Productions a while ago, a couple months ago, uh, with your dad, and your testimony, your stories, your spirit was transcendent. And uh, I am so thankful that you're back here tonight. And I'm so thankful that we get to hear from you. We had incredible feedback on the things that you shared. And I think everybody's been hungering for more. Yeah. 
And so <laughs> rather than me introducing you, Nicola, there we have a video that will give everybody a little introduction to you and the life that you've led and the work that you've dedicated your life to. And so is it okay if we play that video and introduce introduce you once again to this amazing Onward Productions audience? That would be perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh -oh. Hello, I am Erin and this is Steve. Blank. Catherine. Catherine. I'm Emily. Emily. I am Lucia. What's your name? This is Moe Jackson with Max Saxon. Alright. My name is Aiden. Hi. I'm Alice. Hi. This is Luke's name. <laughs> um, one word to describe this Clarence class is upbeat, lovable, always happy, inspiring, friendships, thoughtful, positive, very caring, everything is amazing, lovable, cheerful, energetic, pure awesomeness, <laughs> super fun, lively. They teach more about life and love than I could ever teach them. They are so quick to forgive. They love you perfectly. It doesn't matter, like one of my favorite things is, like they don't love us because of who we are and what we do, they love us because of who they are. They are so pure in spirit that it's so fun to just observe. They find the lonely person, they find the person who's sad or angry or whatever they're feeling and they're so intuitive. I think there are so many things that this kid, these kids teach me, and I think a lot of it um, is to take the scenic route. Why do we take the scenic route? It's the most beautiful. You you find joy in the journey. Um, these kids really help you understand what true joy is. The magic of the classroom is the kids. We really do learn the service mentality, that service is transforming for both the giver and the receiver. So you come in, you put other people's wants, needs, desires before your own, and it makes you truly happy. I think right now, especially in middle school and high school, building the foundation of service learning, building the foundation of inclusion and kindness, and really understanding what that means and how to apply it will help you for the rest of your life. I believe happiness is a choice, but if you can learn that early on, <laughs> this course class is powerful. Yeah. It's genuine. It's like a second home. It makes me feel like myself. Because of you, we have all learned to not take things for granted. And because of you, we've all learned to love everything. Because of you, we've all found true happiness. Because of you, we all plan on working with kids with different abilities. I, I can't hear you. So how about how about now? Is that <laughs> okay, I'm like, uh -oh. <laughs> you're like wait a second? <laughs> Thank you for telling me. I I muted my mic so that we didn't get feedback during the video, and I forgot to turn it back on. You would think after a year and a half of Zoom calls, we'd remember to unmute ourselves. Not this guy. <laughs> I was saying that I don't know if everybody was watching you. I was watching you during that video, and there were so many times when your smile would just light up the screen because the love that you have for these individuals that you've worked with for so many years was so evident. And I think it was such a window into your soul and who you are. And I am so excited to be able to hear from you once again. And so without further ado, over to you, Nicola. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, that video means so much to me. Uh, four of my interns, the ones that you saw at the end of that video made that for me. Um, my last year teaching. So it means so much to me to watch that and share that with you. Um, I love that brother Peter Vidmar and President Wilcox and I are on the same program. I'm not exactly sure how this happened, but I could not be more grateful to be here and more humbled that I get to share the program with them. But I just love that we have different perspectives, different experiences that could all bring us together tonight. Um, when Shane and Mandy called and asked me to speak at this fireside and told me the theme was turning goals into gold, I immediately asked myself, 
what does turning goals into gold mean to me? So with the Olympics right around the corner and getting to hear from brother Peter Vidmar tonight, I think we all have gold medals on our minds. <laughs> Um, obviously, most of us are not gymnasts and we're not trying to win the Olympic gold medal. However, every one of us has our own gold medal that we're working for. So my question tonight is, what is your gold medal? I graduated from BYU in special education with an emphasis on severe, complex, different abilities. And I taught in a middle school for eight years. And as you saw in the video, some of my students are on the autism spectrum. Some have Down syndrome. Some students are nonverbal and in wheelchairs. And I testify that these kids are celestial souls, specifically assigned to their bodies to further accentuate their incredible spiritual strength, their goodness, and Christ-like compassion for all. They teach us that no matter what our past has been, we have a spotless future. And we can't always control what happens to us, but we can always control what happens next. Not one of these beautiful kids with different abilities were ever competing against others. They were only competing against themselves to be the best version of themselves, which is one of the many profound lessons that they teach all of us. Okay, so in my classroom at the beginning, at the beginning of every single class period, every single day, to every individual student, I would always ask, what are you working for? Let me ask all of you the same question. What are you working for? Is it worth working for? And what are you willing to do to get it? One of the students in my class, we'll call him Chad, <laughs> his gold medal was a cheeseburger. And he wanted that cheeseburger more than anything else in the world. Chad also had some of the most challenging behaviors I had worked with that constantly caused him to be distracted, run away, including trying to drive off in a moving truck, true story, <laughs> lose concentration and focus on obstacles instead of a goal. Are we not all guilty of the same thing? So anytime Chad would fall off the cheeseburger path, to help him find his way back, I would simply remind him of what he was working for. We're all human, so like Chad, we're going to make mistakes, right? So what are we supposed to do when that happens? Do we give up and quit? Or do we learn the lesson, get back up and go again, and keep working for our cheeseburger? To help Chad and all of the other students in my class, I created a simple visual behavior management system using a stoplight, green, yellow, red. Green means you're following the rules, you're doing great, keep going. Yellow is a warning, which means you're starting to slip and make bad choices. And red means you've made a mistake and there would be an immediate consequence. The first thing I say when they get to red is that, that is not okay, you are now on red. State their consequence. And then I immediately ask, what do you need to do to get back to green? What are you working for? I immediately switch the focus from the negative to the positive. And as we all know, action produces momentum. The sooner we start to focus on the positive again, repent and take a step in that direction, the quicker we'll be back on the path of righteousness. My dad always says, if you sit around wondering if your glass is half empty or half full, you've missed the point. It's refillable. Thinking positively or thinking negatively doesn't fill up the glass, the pouring does. So what my students are learning and what we learn when we're on red is that discipline is to teach, not to punish. And you can't increase a person's performance by making them feel worse. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland teaches us, repentance is not a long drawn out process. It takes exactly as long for you to repent as it takes you to say, I'll change and mean it. So if some of us are currently on red and feel like there's no way back to green, I promise you that because of our savior, Jesus Christ and his infinite atonement, we can always get back to green. No matter what we've done, no matter how big our mistakes are, no matter how badly we've hurt someone in the process, we can always do better. We can say sorry. And I tell my kids, sorry means I won't do it again. We can choose to forgive, press the reset button and move forward. Ideally, wouldn't it be better if we never got to red by putting in place some warning signs that are truly bright yellow flashing lights that will keep us on green? Let me give you three simple, profound and powerful steps that will keep us on green. But if we do fail and fall, which we will, they will help us get off red, out of yellow, and back on green. So the first step, we need to clarify and understand our identity. If you identify as a physically fit person, you're gonna work out, drink lots of water, nourish your body with healthy foods, because you will do what physically fit people do. If you identify as a noble child of a loving Heavenly Father, you will pray to Him, read your scriptures, and go to the temple to learn of Him, magnify your calling to serve him. You're going to be kind and charitable like his son. 
you will follow his prophet, you will do your righteous routines and holy habits, and ultimately, you will do whatever it takes to defend your identity as a noble child of God. Because of the knowledge of our divine identity, everything will be different for us. Our dress, our language, our priorities, our focus. Why is this so important? Because if we don't correctly understand our divine identity, then we will never clearly understand our divine destiny. And I testify that our divine identity is that we are literal spirit sons and daughters of Almighty God, destined to return to live with him and his son. When we know this, we will have the determination to resist temptation, to continually turn back to God and do whatever it takes to get back on green. The second step is building a strong foundation. Because we live in a fallen world, anytime we set lofty goals to get to green or turn goals into gold, we will inevitably make mistakes, have missteps, and experience trials and tribulations. One of my favorite quotes says, under pressure, we don't rise to the occasion, we sink to the level of our training. Most profound thing that I've learned through my experience with trials is that at the end of the day, when our world collapses and we feel like we're falling flat on our faces, we don't actually hit rock bottom. We hit our foundation, we hit our belief. This foundation is developed before the devil sends forth his mighty winds. And if we're fully converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, our foundation will be built upon the rock of Christ, whereon if men build, they cannot fall. Knowing that Jesus Christ has a specific blueprint for each one of us. We all know that building a foundation takes time. We don't magically wake up one day and we become the man or woman Heavenly Father needs us to be. It takes work, it takes action. It takes making choices every second of every day that continually strengthen our foundation. Sherry Dew teaches us, the gospel isn't a guarantee against tribulation. That would be like a test with no questions. Rather, the gospel is a guide for maneuvering through the challenges of life with a sense of purpose and direction, knowing that all things shall give us experience and shall be for our good. Trials and tribulations are the price we're required to pay to be acquainted with God. So once we realize that we're the architect of our lives and we need to have a strong, firm foundation to build on, we need to decide what we're going to build. What is our desired outcome? So the third step is knowing what we are working for. A real life example of this is when basketball superstar Kobe Bryant was drafted into the NBA in 1996. While every other player drafted went out to celebrate that they had reached their destination, Kobe Bryant went back to the gym. Why? His goal wasn't just to be drafted. His goal was to become the best basketball player he could be, which led him to become one of the best basketball players of all time. What Kobe teaches us is about outcomes. Kobe understood that his outcome wasn't a destination or a box to be checked. It was a continual process. It was a journey. Kobe knew that in order for him to become the best basketball player he could be, which was what he was working for, required daily commitment, daily sacrifice, relentless work ethic, which was why he was always the first one to practice and the last one to leave. It wasn't enough for him to just be a pro basketball player. He wanted to be the best version of himself. May I suggest that what we are truly working for is progressing to become like our savior, Jesus Christ. How do we even begin to pursue such an incredible goal? The scriptures teach us, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith and have not charity, I have nothing. Charity never faileth. The reason charity never fails and the reason charity is greater than even the most significant acts of goodness is that charity, the pure love of Christ, is not an act, but it's a condition or state of being. Charity is attained through a sequence of acts that result in conversion. Charity is something one becomes. The students in my class embody charity every single day. You just saw a glimpse of it in that video. But even though they may have some physical limitations or some cognitive challenges, the abilities and strengths that they possess exemplify Christ's love for us. They are kind. They are inclusive. They have non-judgmental friendships. They are so quick to forgive. And as I said in the intro video, they don't love me because of who I am or what I do. They love me because of who they are and they find the good in everyone. We need to remember that we are all a work in progress and we're all here to help each other on our specific paths. To illustrate my point, 
One day, right before class started, one of my peer tutors was sneaking in the back and I noticed that she was hysterically sobbing. I immediately ran up to her and took her outside to see what was going on. And her peers had made an Instagram account dedicated specifically to bullying her. They called her every name in the book, including calling her hideous and fat. And she was beyond devastated, as you can imagine. As I'm talking to her, one of my sweet students with Down syndrome came around the corner and he obviously didn't know what was going on. They walked up to her and gently touched her face and he said, you're beautiful, I love you. He grabs her hand, walks her all the way to his desk and he says, come sit by me. And the entire class period, he rocked her back and forth, telling her she was beautiful and reminding her how much he loved her. After class, this young lady told me that this was one of her darkest moments and that this boy saved her life. Brothers and sisters, charity is the pure love of Christ. And the way that we turn our goals into gold is by teaming up with him, striving to become like him, and taking advantage of his atonement every day so we can be confident as we go for our ultimate gold, which is returning to live with our Heavenly Father in the celestial kingdom. So as I wrap up, let us remember that we are literal sons and daughters of God. Defend that identity. Build your foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ, and he will support you through your storms. And please remember what you are working for. Write it down and use visual symbols to remind you so you can always strive to be the best version of yourself through the gift of charity. And as we commit and strive to accomplish these things, the best news and the greatest blessing of all is we do not have to do this alone. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me conclude with a reassurance of M. Russell Ballard who said, I testify that there is no greater goal in mortality than to live eternally with our heavenly parents and our beloved savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is more than just our goal. It is also their goal. They have a perfect love for us, more powerful than we can even begin to comprehend. They are totally, completely, eternally aligned with us. We are their work. Our glory is their glory. More than anything else, they want us to come home to return and receive eternal happiness in their presence. I just wanna bear my simple testimony that I know these things to be true because I have seen them work in my life. I bear witness that Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, truly know us and love us perfectly, personally, and individually, which means they know how to help us perfectly, personally, and individually. When we choose to put our full faith and trust in them, miracles happen. And I challenge us to remember that no matter what our past has been, we have a spotless future and we can always get back to green. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, Nicola, look, I love your dad. He's a Hall of Fame speaker. I think you deserve that title as well. That was absolutely magnificent. Thank you so much. You're so sweet. Thank you. You know, um, I was thinking as, as you were speaking, it, it was so profound. So many of the things that you said, and I love, you know, obviously we've got three speakers tonight, all of you prepared individually and separately, but your message was an underline and an exclamation point to what we already heard from brother Vidmar. And I just think, boy, you talked about having that foundation in Christ and that building a foundation happens long before the winds of the adversary blow our way. And uh, I, I, that gave me, I, I would, it caused me to think of it a little bit differently, that what is the work we're willing to put in daily to build the foundation? I think sometimes we do, we think, you know, I go to church or I do the things. And even if we read our scriptures and we say our prayers, even if it's fairly consistent, there's additional work that I think is required in order to build that real foundation. You mentioned Kobe Bryant, and uh, I've, I have a uh, I have a, an individual that I've had a chance to spend some time with, and maybe I've even shared this story on our productions. But um, he was a he was an NBA coach, a championship coach, and he would work with Kobe Bryant during the off seasons. He wasn't a Lakers coach, and he told me a story one time of Kobe Bryant, who uh, was at home watching high school basketball, and saw a high school player do a move. First of all, Kobe Bryant is watching high school basketball at home. Just think of that. Uh, he sees a player do a move 
and Kobe clears the furniture away and he starts to do the move in his living room. And then as soon as he feels like he's got it, he went to the gym and he started to work on it for hours and hours. And this coach asked Kobe, he said, well, when you do something like that, how long do you work on a move? And Kobe Bryant's response was priceless. He said, until. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I felt that 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 reminds me so much of what you shared here tonight. And then you spoke of Kobe. I just think building that foundation and it is not, it is a lifetime pursuit. You mentioned journeys, not destinations. Um, thank you for feeding us. Progressing, you know, so one yeah. time. If you haven't started, now's the time. <laughs> oh, I love you. You're amazing. Thank you so much, Nicola. That was wonderful. So oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> we are gonna, we're gonna send you backstage just for a little while as we welcome our final speaker of the evening, President Brad Wilcox. There he is. President Wilcox, how are you? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful evening we've had. I've been taking notes like crazy. Do you see all that? I've been writing notes down all over the place. Oh, I love you so much. You are Brother Wilcox, when I grow up, I wanna I want to I wanna be like you. You know, I old, know, be, old I, and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I just gotta I, I want everybody to know. I many of you know. President Wilcox, you know he's the second counselor in the Young Men's General Presidency. You very likely heard his talks, you've read his books, but I wanna tell you a story about my friend, Brad. Um, the first time I uh, had an opportunity to speak at EFY, which was a lifelong dream of mine. That was a goal that I'd had since I was a kid, listening to speakers like uh, President Wilcox. I had always wanted to be an EFY speaker because it changed my life. I felt like I wanted to contribute and get back. And uh, for years I'd hoped and finally, uh, I, I guess I paid off the right person, I don't know. I got to go and speak at EFY and lo and behold, my first session, um, President Wilcox was the session director. I was flabbergasted. Here's a man who I've looked up to my whole life and he's a session director for my first EFY. Now, President Wilcox told me, he said, I'm going to come and listen to one of your talks. Now, President Wilcox, you were so instrumental for me because as I don't know if you remember, but I felt very, very out of place. I felt like I, I think I was the only teacher in that session who was not um, a teacher in seminaries and institutes. I was just this random guy who, who was going to come and share some things that, that I felt like the Lord wanted me to share. And you made me feel so welcome. And brothers and sisters, if you're watching, I want you to know, President Wilcox kept his word. Um, thankfully, some of the youth uh, had enjoyed some of the talks that I'd given. And uh, I think it was the last talk that I was giving that week. It was a talk that I felt like the Lord really wanted me to share. And in comes President Wilcox. The room was full. I don't think there were chairs. He sat on the floor. And he, uh, he listened to me speak and he had to leave before it was concluded. But as he, sat and uh, as he sat and listened among these youth, he wrote me a handwritten letter. Who does that? Brad Wilcox does that. And it has become one of my most treasured possessions. President Wilcox, you said things to me in that letter that I will never forget and that helped me feel like I belonged. I can never thank you enough for that. And it is such an extension of the man that you are day in and day out. I love you. I am thankful for you. And I will turn the time over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your enthusiasm. I've noticed that ever since the first time we met. And it's contagious. The youth feel it. You said the room was full. I'm not surprised. The youth respond to you, they respond to your warmth, and uh, you are making a great difference. So thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. What an incredible evening we've had. Um, listening to Peter and Nicola has been a joy, and I want to read you a few of the things that they said, and be thinking about the youth of the church today. The very youth who've just made it through COVID 
and they're just finally getting back to their second hours. They're finally able to go to their camps and conferences. We're finally able to start seeing them gather again and think about their futures and listen to these words through their ears. I loved it when Peter said that his mom read an ad that said, future Olympic gymnasts wanted. Whoa, how would it be if we said future world changers wanted, future missionaries wanted, and then we had that vision of the noble youth instead of looking at their weaknesses to say these are the future Olympic champions wanted. Um, listen to what Peter's coach said to him or what he said about his coach. He said he made hard work fun. Couldn't we do that a little bit more for the youth? Couldn't we make hard work fun for them? And he says, they gave, he gave me a vision of where I could go. Oh, that's what these young people need. They need a vision of where they can go. I loved it when he talked about how his coach made a vow with him. Now, he said that that would be a good idea for us to do, and that's true. But think about it. We've already made more than a vow. We've made the covenant. We are in a covenant relationship with Christ, a covenant relationship with God. And as we think about that, I just hope that the youth of the church will be able to have in their minds, I shook his hand. I shook his hand. I hope every missionary who gets out in the mission field and starts to struggle and wonders why he's still there, why she's still there. I hope they'll remember that phrase, I shook his hand. And they will realize the power that can come into their life through that covenant, through that vow. He said, why are we still, why are we here? What are we doing this for? Is it worth it? Oh, I hope every teenager in the church can answer those questions. Now, Nicola uh, said something too as she was teaching us. And Nicola, you're a wonderful teacher. Whether you're with those special needs young people or whether you are teaching us, you have a gift and I hope you'll just keep using that. But did you hear her when she said service is transforming for the giver and the receiver? Oh, I just hope that that can be internalized by every young person in the church. She says, what do we need to do to get back to green? Also, many people struggle, they falter, and then they think it's all over. They want to put in, they want to throw in the towel. And I wish that every young person could have a leader, a coach that could say, what do we need to do to get back to green? I loved it when she said, we don't hit rock bottom. We reach our foundation. And if our foundation is a belief in Jesus Christ, then we can rebuild. I just love that. Now, she says some questions as well. Look how similar they are to the questions that Peter and his teammate would, would say to each other. Nicola told us to ask, what are you working for? Is it worth it? And what are we willing to do to get it? I just uh, think it's so interesting that after years and years of listening to his coach, Peter, at that moment when two billion people were watching him, and I was one of them, and my mom kept saying, he's a Latter-day Saint, he's a Latter-day Saint, he's a Latter-day Saint. She was so proud. And... Uh, as I was one of those two billion people watching him, I just think what his coach said to him is so significant. You've done this a million times. Oh, man, what if every time our teenagers came up against a battle, up against a battle with temptation, a battle with anti-Mormons, bullies who are making Instagram accounts with them, I just wish every one of them had somebody saying, come on, you've done this a million times. 
you know what to focus on, you know where to turn, you know where your strength is, you know your identity, you're ready. You're ready for this wind. You're ready for this challenge. Lean into it because it's not going to blow you over. You're ready for this. And uh, I hope we can be the coaches uh, that these young people can hear saying those words. You know, the poor little children and youth program got off to a rough start. I mean, you have to admit it. In 2019, they did a big production. Everybody was all excited. Then 2020 came. The world shut down. And, uh, and nobody even knows what the youth program is. I asked teenagers, what's the youth program? They say, goal setting. Then I ask adults, what's the children and youth program? And they say, goal setting? Yeah, goal setting's a little teeny part of it. But I hope that we will all have clear in our minds that the program has three components. First of all, gospel learning. If these young people are in seminary, they're doing the youth program. If they're doing Come Follow Me, they're doing the youth program. If they've got a temple recommend, if they're paying tithing, they're doing the youth program. They're learning the gospel. See, sometimes in the past we've seen the youth program over here and we've seen the church over here. And now it's like this. The second component is service and activities. Man, those peer tutors that were working with Nicola, those interns that were working with her, they are doing the youth program. They are learning what it means to serve. And if these young people are going to camps and conferences this summer, if they help to plan them, they're doing the youth program. If there are any teenagers who are listening to us tonight, and I sure hope there are, guess what? You're doing the youth program. You're doing it. The component of the program is personal development. And that's where goal setting fits in, but not goal setting for goal setting's sake. You don't just set a goal so that you can say you've reached your goal. You don't set a goal so you can chalk it off your list. It's more than that. I asked a young man the other day, so what's your physical goal? And he said, breathe. I said, oh, good. I'm glad you're just really stretching yourself there. I'm glad you're just stepping out of that old comfort zone. It's not just setting a goal. Because then we do choose easy goals. Because then we can say we're done with them. It's more than that. The children and youth program is learning personal revelation. The goal setting is a means to that end. See, a lot of young adults in the church, they used to look, when they were in the youth program, they'd look at a scout book and say, what they want me to do? Or they'd look at a personal progress book and they'd say, what do they want me to do? And now we need our youth to look up at God and say, what do you want me to do? What do you need me to do? And I promise you, he's going to say something besides breathe. He's going to spread us. He's going to take a little 11-year-old boy whose mom saw an ad in the newspaper and turn him into an Olympic gold medalist. He's going to take a young girl and tell her that her major needs to be special education, that she needs to spend her time teaching, not teaching in a typical environment, but in a very different and difficult environment. And when he tells us what he needs us to do, then we can feel empowered by his grace. We can feel empowered to be able to do it. 
see, we don't set goals for the sake of setting goals. We set goals by personal revelation and we reach them as we learn to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. That's how the children and youth program works. If you are to answer the question, what is the children program? I hope you'll say this. It is, as Nicola was saying, it is becoming like Jesus Christ in every aspect of my life. <sighs> That's huge. That's huge. And if that's a little too hard to remember, just say Jesus. What's the children and youth program? Jesus. If you know that answer, then you've got it. And think about how significant that is. Because even a year, two years ago, if you'd have asked most people in the church, what's the youth program? They would have said scouting for boys and personal progress for girls. And not one member of the Church of Jesus Christ would have said Jesus. It's time. It's time for our young people to be able to answer these questions. Why are we here? Jesus. What are we doing this for? Jesus. Is it worth it? Yes. What are you working for? Jesus. Is it worth it? Yes. What are you willing to do to get it? And how can you turn to Christ for his help in doing it? Man, we have adults in the church who are struggling. Struggling to stay strong. Why? Because they never got fingerprinting merit badge? Is it because they never got citizenship in the community? That's the one they missed. No, they got their badges. Is it because they never got their medallion, their young women medallion? No, they got their necklaces. But through all of that, they never connected with Christ in such a personal way. That they would never dream of leaving him. Ever dream of leaving his church. They haven't connected with him in a covenant relationship. So that when times get hard, they can say, I shook his hand. And that can mean something. I leave my testimony that the gospel is true. And I leave my testimony that children and youth program is inspired. And it is a program for our time. Everything that's done for youth all through the generations has been positive and moved us forward. But it's time. It's time now. When 59% of young adults who were raised in a church, any church, are leaving religion, turning their back on God and Christ. Now, thankfully, the stats in the church are a lot better than the stats in many churches. But we all know young people who have struggled, who are struggling, and we do not give up hope for any of them. 
because Jesus. Remember that goals for goals sake is not the answer. We can get kids whipped up to set goals, but when it comes to really following through, it's going to take more than just a goal setting program. It's going to take a program that teaches them personal revelation, teaches them to exercise faith in Christ, and teaches them that in their covenant relationship with Christ, they will have all the strength that they need to fail and keep going, to succeed and stay humble. They will have everything they need to be empowered to become more like him. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. What's the children and youth program? You better say it. Yep, you got it. Amen. Amen. Oh, President Wilcox, thank you. Um, I needed to hear that. I've got a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 7-year-old at home. And uh, I need to refocus what we're trying to do there. Thank you for that. You know, President Wilcox, I have loved to listen to you speak for years. And I hope you don't mind me saying you've always spoke with power and authority. But there is a different mantle upon your shoulders. Thank you. And it is uh, remarkable to witness. And I'm thankful that I could do that tonight. Thanks. Thank you for what you shared. Thank you. You know, while uh, you were concluding, I was going to YouTube and copying the link of this event to send to, uh, we were in ward council today and we were talking a little bit about this and I'm sending it to the ward council and saying, please watch this event. Let's make sure that the focus is Jesus. Um, so thank you so much. Well, brothers and sisters, we have been richly fed this evening. Now, if you have questions or comments, for any of the three speakers. In fact, let's bring Brother Vidmar and Nicola back on the screen right now. Hey, you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. If you have questions or comments for this incredible panel of outstanding individuals, please go and put them in the chat. And if there aren't any questions or comments, it's because you all have answered all of the questions without even knowing. <laughs> <laughs> that you were answering the questions. Um, but I'm going to give it just a second here and see if anybody puts anything in the chat. And if not, we'll get to have a closing prayer from Nicola and then we'll be able to uh, to get back to our families. And I, uh, oh, here we go. We have, let's see, let's see what this says. Oh, this is a comment from George saying, when the Utah Jazz won a rivalry game, the team was celebrating. Nobody could find Carl Malone. He was in the back working the treadmills, getting ready for the next one. That is what made him one of the best ever. <laughs> I like that. I uh, I think it was this season Rudy Gobert got kicked out of a jazz game, and he went in the back and started to lift. And I thought, oh, there you go. There's there's commitment. Uh, and uh, we have we have Tensha Rose who says, "Thank you all. If I may share, single adults are over fifty percent. Strength will come through social activities. We need." Oh, it just pop. We need more activities to feel united, heard, and understood. Plus, find a companion equally yoked. I love the Zoom meeting for single adults. Elder Anderson and others hosted with single adults. Yes, what a wonderful event that was. Um, I don't see any questions. I think you guys answered them all. Any final words before we wrap up and have uh, Sister McCulloch give us a give us a closing prayer? We just want to say thanks to Shane and Mandy Johnson who put this all together. They just have been so diligent in serving others, and we're so grateful to be associated with them and very thankful for all their extra miles. 
I will add my voice to that. Shane and Mandy are always in the background. They are always thinking about those whose lives need to be touched by powerful messages. I don't know how they do it, where they have the time or the strength, but it is incredible. And Onward Productions is such a wonderful place to be able to gather. Well, President Wilcox, Brother Vidmar, Sister McCulloch, thank you for this wonderful and incredible evening. And we are going to close with a closing prayer from our friend Nicola, and we'll be done for tonight. Our dear friend, Father in heaven, we are so grateful to come before you this night. We are so grateful for the spirit that we have felt tonight. So grateful for Shane and Mandy and for Brother Clayson, for President Wilcox and for Brother Vidmar. So grateful for their sweet and powerful spirits. So grateful for their messages. Please help their messages to pierce our hearts and be able to um, inspire us to do better and be better and, and ultimately progress to become more like thee and thy son. We are so grateful for thy son, Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for the knowledge that we have, that he knows us and that he loves us and that he is here to help us. We're so grateful for all of the many blessings that that was given to us. And we're especially grateful that we could gather here tonight. Please bless the youth of this church. Please bless, bless the youth everywhere. Please, um, please help them to know how incredible they are and how much thou loves them and how um, powerful and strong and um, capable they are. Please help us moving forward that we may Always have thy spirit to be with us and uh, again, strive to be more like thee and thy son. And we love thee so very much. We acknowledge thy hand in all things and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks right. everybody. Thank you. All. <laughs> Thank you. There's, Bye, a everybody. There's a heart coming out to you right there. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs>